And then in 43 BC, Gaius Julius Caesar was declared God. And so now, so Octavian became Gaius Julius Caesar Dimi Filius, the son of a god. Right? That's about as strong as you can get in Roman nomenclature, although we'll see he went even higher. Uh, this, by the way, this uh, statue here, I believe, if I'm right, is in the museum down the street in the National Museum in Athens. A kind of eerie looking one with no eyes. Up there. The evil Octavian, the nice Octavian down in the left there. You want to look at it that way. Ultimately, he would, survive, he, would, uh, he would emerge as the sole survivor and victor for Caesar's position. As I said, there's no need to follow out the details, but there are a couple of points that I need to bring out to remind you of for you people in Roman history and for you who haven't done Roman history, inform you of, so that we'll have the background before we get to uh, Augustus and Athens. After the assassination of Caesar, Brutus and Cassius, the chief <coughs> conspirators, went to the east. Brutus into Greece and Cassius into Syria. For you people who do your Horus, you remember that's where Horus met Brutus and eventually ended up on Brutus' side, uh, losing in the, in the great defeat of Brutus, but surviving to go on to be the great uh, poet at Rome. Um, each of the assassins in the east spent their time building their forces for what would be a showdown between Caesar's heir, Octavian, or Octavius, and Marcus Antonius, remember, Julius Caesar's best friend. The showdown took place at Philippi in Thrace in 42. Both assassins were defeated and both perished, so they're out of the way. With that common enemy out of the way, remember there was a triumvirate in Rome, the so-called second triumvirate of uh, uh, Gaius Octavius, or Octavian, Marcus Antonius, and a character named Marcus Aemilius Lepidus. Um, by 36, Lepidus had been pushed out of the way, and a triumvirate became a duumvirate. Um, now, meanwhile, between about 40, 38, 40, 40, 38 BC and 30 BC, Antonius spent most of his time in the east, in Greece. He was a great philhellite, spent a lot of time in Athens, and then, of course, ultimately, as you know, he made his way down to Egypt. Um, oh, here's, uh, by the way, I want to show you, this is a coin of Octavia, and it shows you how he used the memory of Caesar. All he had as an 18, 19-year-old kid was the name of Caesar, but he used it to the greatest, the greatest extent he could. Here you've got... Uh, uh, the uh, um, Octavian is a triumvirate. So it's, you can just see the three there, and then weary, weary, triumvirate. So Kaiser triumvirate. That's Octavian. And then over here uh, is the seat and the crown that the Senate had voted that at any games that he attended, Caesar could present and sit in. And so he used those. Octavian used them as symbols of Caesar on these coins. It's a way you communicated. The word, no newspapers, no CNN, etc. Coins were the way you communicated with the people. Uh, and symbolism like that. Um, Antonius and Cleopatra here got together in, in the east. Um, you'll see that the one thing you'll immediately recognize about Cleopatra from this bus is she wasn't a great beauty. As Plutarch said, her nose was too, too large. Uh, there's a coin of hers here up at the top. But Antonius is very interesting. It looks like the kind of character you meet in an Irish pub here on the left. <coughs> uh, really rough bruiser. Huh? Um, a little softened image over there, anyways. Uh, so they joined up together. So that's where Antonius is in the east with Cleopatra, not only in love with her, but also depending upon the ample resources she had of Egypt to provide men and forces for him. Now, two Romans sharing power is an oxymoron. Uh, and eventually it came to a showdown between um, Octavians and the forces of the motherland in Italy against the deluded Antonius, bewitched by Cleopatra, and the forces of the decadent East, or at least that's the way the propaganda of Octavian presented it to the Roman people. Um, the final confrontation took place at Actium in Western Greece. We'll get to a map of it later. This is Lorenzo Castro's depiction of the battle. You can see, uh, looks like a boat escaping here with a woman in it, so that's clearly Cleopatra. And Marcus Antonius Grace. making a run for it. Okay, so uh, the depiction of Actium here, and uh, that was the final, final battle. All right, so Actium was the final defeat of Antonius and Cleopatra. They would live on for another year, but eventually would perish. So that's the background, uh, the general background of what I'm <coughs> talking about. Um, one last thing, the full image of Augustus. In 27 BC, uh, it was proposed, among other honors given to him at the time, that Caesar's heir be given the title Augustus. Um, it's an archaic term 
with religious connotations. It means a thing or a person which must be held as sacred and worthy of respect due to its connection with tradition. Seems to be about the closest we can come to it in English in terms of its full impact in the Latin language. Um, and this is the way he would look for the rest of his time. He would live on for 44 more years and he would never change, at least according to his statues. Uh, the statue on the left, of course, is the famous Augustus uh, Prima Porta, uh, uh, where it was found. It's in the Vatican now. It's called Augustus Prima Porta. Augustus as the kind of consummate military man in his curas and so on. And then over here, Augustus as the Roman senator, the Roman statesman, the so-called Augustus Togathus. Augustus in the But as I say, he will never change. You'll find these all over the Roman Empire now, these images. Um, uh, and that is the kind of final evolution of this young man over 20, 20 years or so until he finally got full power. Now, a couple of things about this title up at the top. This is his final name, Imperator Kaiser Augustus. Um, it has absolutely no precedent in Latin nomenclature. It combines the traditional salutation of a Roman army to its victorious general, Imperator, um, with a gentilicial name of the Kaisar's family, and with a newly invented title of Augustus. It rings with the main concerns of Roman culture, martial achievement, familial identity, and reverence for the gods and things of great tradition and the past. For all its impressive tone, however, like much about the Augustan era, it's somewhat odd and contradictory. Augustus was never a great military commander personally. That is to say, he could never have won the title Imperator the old-fashioned way, i.e. to earn it in battle. Um, he was adopted into the family of Caesar. He really wasn't a Caesar. He, by Roman terminology, he was Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus, as I said. Um, and, he was, and the title Augustus, for all its seeming claim to tradition, was a startling novelty of nomenclature that had no precedent in Roman onomastica. So Gaius Octavius had completely remade himself into something so Roman that, was, that it was unique and therefore almost not Roman, among his, as I say, among his contradictions. Okay, so the background to Augustus, who Augustus was, how he developed. Augustus in Athens. Now, given the length of time that Augustus ruled after acting, 44 years, and the importance of Athens as the first city in Greece and the, probably the greatest city with political and cultural tradition in the Mediterranean at the time, remarkably little is known about the relationships between Augustus and Athens. There are some buildings from the era, and we'll talk about those. There's the standard collection of inscriptions that don't tell us all that much about larger affairs. There will be one inscription, however, that would interest me significantly. And there are a few references in the literature, and it's with those that I'll be concerned so they, seem, they, they don't seem to have really gotten the attention that they need, um, and also be concerned, as I say, with that one inscription. But what little is known about Augustus in Athens is intriguing and troubling from their point of view. It's important, it's important to note that in uh, general about Athens, it's important to note a couple of things about Athens in general in this era. It had had a very rocky relationship with Rome in the last two generations of the Roman Republic, from the years about 100 BC to 30 BC. It had supported Mithridates of the Pontus in his revolt against Rome in the 90s, and eventually Athens found itself under siege, then taken and then looted by Lucius Cornelius Sulla in the year 86. And you can see the remnants of that all throughout the city even today in the archaeological record. Then it had a remarkable record of backing the wrong horse all through 20 years of Roman civil war uh, that brought it close to the Roman Republic and brought out Augustus. So if we look at the map here, in 48 BC, Athens supported Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, Pompey the Great, in his war against Julius Caesar. He lost to Caesar at Pharsalus in 48, right there, Thessaly. In 42, Athens supported the assassins Brutus and Cassius in their war against Caesar's heir Octavian and Marcus Antonius. They were defeated at Philippi in 42 up there in Thrace. In 31 BC, Athens supported Antonius and Cleopatra against Caesar's heir in the Battle of Actium. That over there in Western Greece, right there, in 31. In this case, by the way, Athens was in the majority. Only two cities in Greece supported um, uh, Octavian, and that was Sparta and Mantinea. 